welcome back to another episode of Justification. Thank you for tuning in for another week. Thank you for giving this, our dialogue, your time, uh, your care, your attention. Thank you for giving to this subject, your time, your care, and also your attention. And just simply thank you for having a mind that is open to the things that are within the Bible and to observing what is in the Bible from a different lens, from a different perspective, to jog memory of what we know, to get it into a perspective or a point of view where we can know it better, where we can better define it according to our experience, according to our thoughts, according to our feelings, our real and genuine thoughts and feelings. So thank you for opening up your heart, opening up your mind, opening up your home to me and to the things uh, that are within the Bible that have been shown to me as I've studied them uh, very deeply. And continuing from our last meeting, we ended with a thought on transition, a thought on transition and a thought of revival or birth from that transition in this birth. This birth, of course, is not uh, literal or natural. This transition is not a natural or a literal transition. This is a transition of our faith's intellect into a higher plane or realm or sphere of existence for us, for our human being, for our character, for who we intend to be now, uh, where we've come from, making sense of that, and the relationship we care to have with the living God in the future. And so we have, we have some questions to answer. Right, we have we have some questions to answer because the things that we have been studying up until this point have been different. They have been different. The way that the first apostles taught their doctrine is not what we are used to hearing or or meditating on. We are used to a physical a physical grasp of our spirituality, but the Bible is taking us into a route that is not physical taking us into a route that is mental and that is full of experience. And that is, in a sense, what we will touch on this morning, knowledge. And so where we last left off takes us to where we're going to begin at this point, which is a question, which question we can, we can find in the book of John chapter three. And this is the heart or the essence or the beginning essence of what the living God, chief apostle, taught, what actually got him crucified. This this revolutionary idea, which really, really wasn't so revolutionary because it existed in Abraham, performed it. But at this point in time in history, and in our own, it is unknown. And so John 3, verse 4, John chapter 3 and verse 4, the question is asked, the author writes, Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? And so what we don't understand is that from the first chapter into the second chapter, now into this third chapter, the philosophy of this man is being preached, but vaguely. It's being given, but as a parable. And so by the time we reach John chapter 3 and verse 4, there is a chief high priest, someone who is graduated with a uh, master's in divinity, PhD and whatnot. And he's having a little bit of a hard time understanding why this individual is speaking about a, a birth from oldness. How this individual is framing this term oldness is confusing. How this individual is, is talking about what needs to be termed or framed old and what needs to be put away, what needs to be revived or resurrected, is something that is not consistent in the religious philosophy of the Jew. Because the religious philosophy of the Jew believes that, quote unquote, oldness is the way to know and to approach the living God. So is this... Again, oldness. Is it literal oldness? If this birth is not literal, and it is not, is, it, is this oldness literal? What are we to make of this? 
The idea of this oldness actually ties into what we have been discussing about the illustration of the living God's chief apostle, crucified. Which illustration points to the fact of a passing away of something, whatever that physical body represents, that is the oldness that is represented as passing away. So when we see that body crucified, what the first apostles taught is that we should not see that body as a physical human male body. This body figuratively illustrates something old or some old thing that is to be crucified and that is to pass away. Relating to us. The illustration is supposed to relate to us in that what we are seeing is that there is something old within us. Remember, when we began our, our time together, we, we, we talked about this these words, us and we. Something old from us is to pass away and is to be considered as dead. The book of Romans chapter 6. The book of Romans chapter 6 and verse 5 and 6. This is the, con this is the controversy. Romans chapter 6 and verse 5 and 6. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that what? That our what? Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him. That the, and this is key, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. So if we're going to look at this individual's human body crucified, it is to be looked at as a body of sin. It is a body of sin. This body, the body of the man, is to represent an item connoting the definition of sin. And so when we talk about this death, when we talk about this reviving, when we talk about this sin, we are talking about the passing away of an old man. Whether you are male or female, an old man is to pass away from you. And in right context, the right language, this old man is not a literal old man. This old man is an old mind. We've, we've discussed this or come across this in previous meetings together. Paul's, Paul's giving us in very vague or parable-like language the doctrine of the philosophy at the heart of the Bible, which is found at the center of the crucifixion, which is that there is to be a like death for a like reviving. Now, what passed away if we're going to go by the illustration that Paul is giving us in the book of Romans, chapter 6, verses 5 and 6, what is crucified is an old man or an old mind. What is crucified is an old mind, not a man. See, the first apostles, when they taught their doctrine, they, they did their best to get ministers away from the physicality of it all. Yes, a physical illustration was given. Yes, it is really, really easy to mix up physical with what is not physical. But the apostles and Paul tried to keep the separation there. And the separation is evident. Because again, it goes back to how Moses prophesied, he that is hanged is the curse of God. So is the literal individual that is crucified a curse of God? This, this, this should be a controversy. This, this should make no sense to us to worship an individual who by crucifixion, flat out, there is no if, ands, or buts, is a curse of God. The life of this individual, the respect of this individual, the fame of this individual, the value of this individual diminishes due to him being crucified. If we're going to take this literal, making this individual really worthless to us. If we're going to take this literal. But the first apostles did not take this in that manner. They, they took it a step further. 
So taking that step further, they actually understood that what they were seeing was a figurative illustration of what was to occur inwardly within the conversation. If John 4.24 is right, that God is a spirit, what is the curse of God cannot be the individual. The individual, human being, has absolutely nothing to do with the matter. How can I say this? In the book of Isaiah 53. <clears throat> In the book of Isaiah 53. In the book of Isaiah 53 and verse 11, we read, By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many. The Bible separates the individual from his words. It is the words of the individual that are to justify. It is the knowledge of the individual that is to justify. This is why Paul in his instructions is, is, his instructions are physical, right? No, his instructions are physical for the experience. If we are put to death or are willing to be put to death, like as this man was put to death, we will also be raised in the same likeness as he was risen. Paul in parable is, in, is referencing the knowledge attached to the experience of letting what is old pass away. It is in the frame of justification that knowledge, according to the Bible, according to the Bible, it is the knowledge of the man that is to justify. The Bible separates the man from what the man taught. What the man taught is what is to justify. This is why he said, if you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you will live. Is this literal? Is the call to eat a, a man's flesh and blood literal? Where is the man today so that I can get me some of this flesh and blood to eat? And even back then was the man literally speaking. Did when he say this, they lay him down and cut him up into pieces and begin to eat him. None, none of this is literal, nor can we prefigure these words into some sort of physical sense by making a connotation of physical items and objects into what these things may mean to us. That's not, that's far, that's very far from what the intention is. To eat the flesh and to drink the blood is to pass through the living devotional experience of this individual. To pass through the struggle of what Isaiah 53 and 11 is saying of knowledge. It is the experience of this individual's words that justifies. And again, from the first time we have met up until this point, the context of justification, the context of to justify continues to evolve and continues to become more refined. Because now we're seeing that the Bible is defining the word justify or justification or redemption or salvation very specifically. It's allocating these references to one pinpoint address, which is a reviving via my righteous servant's knowledge. And so when we're hearing our old man is crucified, if there is no physical object to crucify that old mind with, and if the Bible isn't calling for us to physically abuse our own self, that crucifixion that we are to enjoy is to occur by only one means. Again, Isaiah 53 and 11 tells us, by the means of knowledge. 
And is this weird to say? Is this is this weird? Like what what is what is Paul alluding to? What what is the Bible alluding to by saying by his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many? Because our mind is trained, right? Our mind is trained uh, theologically to believe that justification uh, does not really happen in this manner, that salvation does not happen in this manner, that redemption does not happen in this manner. Our, our religious training really diverges, is, is going a different route from what we are hearing in the Bible. In the book of Philippians, we've reviewed this verse before, but I, I feel right now it is, it is really decent for us to review again. Philippians chapter 3, Philippians chapter 3, verses 8 through 10. Philippians chapter 3, verses 8 through 10 reads, Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of what? I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung, do count them but dung that I may win Christ and be found in him not having mine own righteousness, which we're getting into the second part of what this knowledge, of what this justification is. This is what it means to be justified. This is the end result. This is what we are to be justified from. This was the controversy the first apostles taught, and this was the controversy the living God's chief apostle taught and was crucified for. And be found in him not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may what him? That I may know him. That I may know him. And the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. There is a theme. There is a beautiful theme that the first apostles have in their doctrine. There is a theme that the living God's chief apostle has in his doctrine. And that theme is advancement, growth, and development in our conversations, thought and feeling by knowing the living God. By experiencing, by experiencing what the living God means in his words and in the learning experience that is offered. This is why, by his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, the experience is the change. We've spent past episodes and time together reviewing what that change was to be. In summary, for years and for generations, they have taught my commandments by the precept of ministers and priests. But I will turn their wisdom upside down and I will turn this experience upside down. I will make darkness light before them. I will lead them into dark places and I will correct them to see straight things. The experience is a transition in how we maintain our conversation in episodes prior. We reviewed that the intention within the Bible is the development and the consistent development and the continual development of our conversations, thoughts, and feelings. This is to occur through the process of justification, which process is forwarded by the knowledge, by the understanding, by the experience that is offered and taught through what the living God's chief apostle gave, the words that he gave. And the words that he gave were a passing away, a need for the individual conversation to pass away from its inherited or taken on conversation old mind of devotional thought to embrace a resurrection in a new experience, an experience of knowing. 
And how is our experience to know the words of the Bible without mixing up with them? We know the story of, um, what is it, Israel, Jacob. Jacob wrestling with the angel. And then afterwards receiving a new name. This, this prefigures what we are to inwardly do at this point in time. We are to wrestle with the words of the Bible for a new name. Not a new literal name, but a new name of expression for our faith's intellect and confidence. We're to go through a transition in name, a transition in confidence, a transition in landmark, a transition in landmark. And this transition occurs as we put off or put down in the same like manner, our old mind of devotional thought. Suffering the same like crucifixion, meaning we cannot literally, and the Bible is not advising us to literally kill ourselves. We are to literally handle, and we are to literally put to death our old devotional thoughts and feelings. Step one. We are to allow our conversation that we have, that we hold as true, our, de our, foundational, our foundational denominational traditional religious understanding that we stand on. We are to let that die willingly. It is to willingly be crucified so that we can then have the opportunity in liberty, liberty of mind, liberty of devotional or conversational or spiritual thought and feeling to experience the words that are within the Bible. Doing so, we will discover the knowledge of what the Bible is giving us. Which knowledge Paul articulates. Suffering the loss of all things. Everything that I just said is what Paul is writing. These all things... They're not primarily or firstly natural. The Bible is not primarily or firstly a natural book. This is a philosophical book for the culture of the religion. Editing the religion's culture is the Bible's primary placement. Reason. Action. It is our conversation's conscience that is to pass through an amendment in its approach to the living God. This amendment and its approach will then affect our human being the more we allow it to consistently heal because it is a healing. We are resurrecting our faith by allowing ourselves to experience what the words of the Bible are saying. And this is what Paul is getting at. The body of sin is to be put away because the that crucified body of the living God's chief apostle, it is to represent the definition of sin. So what is crucified in right context in language, the illustration is pointing to the crucifixion of a body or a knowledge of sin. This body of sin, we find the definition of it in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 56. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 56. Just briefly, the sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. The crucifixion of the living God's chief apostle redefined sin. It redefined sin as the philosophy of the religious law. The strength of sin is the law. This is why in the book of Galatians, Paul emphasizes what he means. Galatians 3.13, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law. Christ hath redeemed us from sin. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, which is the definition of sin being made a curse for us. For it is written, quoting Moses in the book of Deuteronomy, cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. That physical body represents the definition of sin. And to see that body crucified is to see sin crucified. 
And so from within the Bible, the, the terms that we are so familiar with, terms like salvation and redemption and justification and terms like sin, the Bible defines them differently from how our religious culture would have us believe them to be. When we step into the realm of the Bible, we are stepping into a realm of thought that already exists. The Bible defines itself. The Bible explains itself. The Bible has a philosophy within its own self that doesn't need us adding anything to it. But what we have in, in all that we know is what is added on to the philosophy that is within the Bible. What is added on to the philosophy that is within the Bible is not true to what is within the Bible. The controversy, yes, is over sin. The controversy, yes, is over dying and reviving. The controversy, yes, is, is over salvation. But when, when, when stepping outside of the Bible, these definitions and this controversy, it gets tainted. When in the Bible, we have a right light to guide us that we may allow what we know or what we think we, we know about what is in the Bible to help us or to help assure us of what we need to put confidence in. The reason for what this individual died for is found in the illustration of his death. There is to be a passing away for a reviving. What is to pass away is our old man, our old mind, our old conversation. That conversation that believes that by deeds, acts, rituals, and belief on theories and doctrines and creeds and so on and so forth, we are right to the divine eye. This is what the Bible now calls sin today. To stay from sin by understanding and exercising what we find in the Bible, we arrive at what the Bible's knowledge is, which is to allow a resurrection in thought and feeling to direct us into a more sure experience with the living God. The Living God's Chief Apostle has liberated our conversation from this former way of expression to now understanding and knowing the Living God and this is just.